by any standard, this coup is an interruption of a progress, of a process that Niger has been engaged in for 30 years. Welcome to Global Dispatches, a podcast for the foreign policy and global development communities and anyone who wants a deeper understanding of what is driving events in the world today. I'm your host, Mark Leon Goldberg. I am a veteran international affairs journalist and the editor of UN Dispatch. Enjoy the show. On July 26, the democratically elected president of Niger, Mohamed Bazoum, was arrested by military leaders in a coup. This coup seemingly came out of nowhere. Unlike recent coups in neighboring Mali and Burkina Faso, there were no protests or really any public indications that the government was under any sort of threat. In fact, just the opposite was the case. When Bazoum was elected in 2021, it was the first time since 1960 that one elected leader in Niger succeeded another elected leader. Niger is one of the poorest countries in the world, but the economy had been improving in recent years. And Bazoum's approach to jihadist insurgencies, which had been devastating communities in parts of Niger, had shown some impressive results. Violence was at a two-year low. But despite the apparent progress, the head of the presidential guard, General Tiani, ousted Bazoum in a coup. Now, a country that was a key U.S. ally and a French ally in the region is suddenly in turmoil. There is also a good deal of concern that the new Nigerian junta may turn to Moscow for support just like the coup leaders in Mali and Burkina Faso. Joining me to discuss the coup in Niger and what comes next is Leonardo Villalon, professor of African politics at the University of Florida. We kick off discussing the possible motivations of the coup leaders and then have a long conversation about the domestic, regional, and geopolitical implications of this coup. If you are new to the podcast, welcome. We've had a a lot of new subscribers and followers in recent weeks. Take a moment to peruse our robust archives. There are over 900 episodes of this podcast now available. Be sure to hit subscribe or follow to get access to our full archive and whatever podcast listening app you're using. It's also a good way to make sure that you're delivered new episodes as soon as they are ready. And we publish two episodes a week, every Monday and every Thursday. And if you are a regular listener to the show and want to subscribe to our free newsletter as well, please visit globaldispatches.org. It's a great way to keep in touch with all the rest of the work that we're doing here at Global Dispatches. Now, here is my conversation with Professor Leonardo Villalon of the University of Florida. So I take it you were recently in Niger and... As far as you could tell, there was no signs of an incipient coup. Yeah, that's correct. I was in Niger actually twice this year. I was there in January and then in June for a couple of weeks, including in eastern Niger and Zinder. And no, there were certainly no public signs of an incipient coup. The situation is relatively calm, both in Niamey and the capital and outside. That doesn't mean, of course, that there weren't lingering tensions below the surface, but there were certainly no indications of it. And that's what makes this coup particularly, I think, unique is that, you know, there was no foment. There was no public protest that led to the military takeover of presidential powers. It seemed to come out of nowhere. Can you walk us through the events of July 26, such as we know it? Yeah. And you're exactly right. There was no immediately obvious precipitating cause. And, you know, in contrast to Mali, for example, a couple of years ago, when 
the elected president there, Ibrahim Boubacar Keita, Ebeka, was overthrown. It was preceded by weeks, months, even of protests and popular demonstrations and a lot of dissatisfaction that was publicly demonstrated. And if we compare this coup also to previous ones in Niger, each of those, the last three, were precipitated also by a real political crisis that went on and dragged on and the institutions were blocked. So that wasn't the case here. So what appears to have happened in this coup then, being different from both recent neighbors and from the history in Niger, I think this was much more about personal grievances or corporate in the sense of institutional ones by the presidential guard. It appears that President Bazoum was considering at least replacing the head of the presidential guard, the man who's now in charge, General Chani, and that this started out as, in fact, the first day or so of it, I had my colleagues and friends in Niger were saying, it's not clearly a coup. It seems that the president has been taken hostage and is being held. It appeared that there might be a negotiation possible to sort of negotiate out of the initial situation. Within a day, the evening, this element of the military did declare that they were in charge. And within another day, the rest of the military followed suit and said that they, it sounded somewhat reluctant, but that they were going along with it in part to avoid a bloodbath because there was for a little bit the specter of the possibility that you would have one part of the military turn against another. That would have been an ugly scene, obviously. So it's not unreasonable to think that General Tiani mounted this coup to avoid being fired and that the rest of the military didn't necessarily want a you know bloody street battle in Niamey. So they went along with it. And now we're in this weird situation where Bazoum is locked somewhere in his home, presumably, but is still receiving calls from people like Antony Blinken, receiving international visitors. It's sort of like this odd situation. Yeah, I think it's not unreasonable to think that this is largely a personally driven. It, obviously, I think it's not just him and his person, but perhaps there was a sense of grievance among the entire presidential guard about some of the ways they were being treated. I'm not privy. I don't have any inside knowledge of it. I think that it is perfectly reasonable. But in fact, you're right. President Bazoum seems to be, as far as we understand, we've seen photographs of him a few, couple of days ago with President Debbie of interim President Debbie from Chad next door. He seems to be in good health. He seemed to be even in good spirits. He was smiling in those photographs. The first two days, for sure, he still had his phone and was still communicating on social media and by phone. I'm not sure if that's the case at the moment. But yes, he seems to be basically being held hostage, and that is being held under house arrest would probably be the better term. Yeah, it was odd. In those first few days, I'd sort of get updates from the U.S. mission to the United Nations that like Linda Thomas-Greenfield spoke to him by phone just after he'd been deposed. And it was sort of odd to think that the coup leaders would just like let him have access to the outside. But that seems to be the case. That seemed to be the case for sure. And apparently he also spoke to Secretary of State Blinken, who it might be interesting to remind the listeners had visited Niger earlier this year. And uh, I believe certainly the most uh, significant recent visit by such a high-ranking American official to Niger, largely to express support for President Bazoum. So this coup happened. General Tiani and his leaders are presumably in the process of trying to consolidate power in Niger. And there was a rather strong reaction by the regional bloc, ECOWAS, over the last several days, including a threat of military intervention. Could you just describe what is driving the response by ECOWAS right now? ECOWAS took a very strong stance, saying that they would not tolerate this coup and were leaving open all options, including military intervention, to reverse it. I would note that as of yesterday, I guess, they seem to have slightly walked it back by noting that intervention, military intervention is a last resort, presumably highlighting the fact that they would prefer a negotiated settlement of this. But in any case, ECOWAS is indeed taking a very strong stance, and the threat of a military intervention is certainly still there and hanging in the air. When we talk about ECOWAS, which is the Economic Community of West African States, there is like a first among equals, which is Nigeria. And there's a new president in Nigeria, Bola Tinubu, who appears, like for media reports, to be taking this coup kind of seriously and kind of personally as well. It absolutely seems to be the case. And 
yes, ECOWAS uh, Nigeria is certainly the first among equals, and historically it's the powerhouse in the region. But I think it hadn't necessarily in recent years played the most prominent role, and under President Tinubu seems to be stepping up again to taking that sort of the most vocal, most visible role. So I do think that's what's driving, or significantly part of what's driving the ECOWAS reaction at the moment. And of course, we have to remember, Niger and Nigeria share a very, very long border. So this is not just happening elsewhere in West Africa. This is happening right on Nigeria's doorstep and a lot of very strong connections across that border. Now, the other thing, ECOWAS, of course, has a lot of frustration among many of the member states of ECOWAS about their relative incapacity or relative failure, I think, to stop and or to do much about a series of other coups, right? Uh, We've had coups now in the last couple of years in in Mali and in Burkina and in Guinea. And those three countries, we have to note, have broken with ECOWAS. Mali, I believe, has been reinstated. Burkina is still suspended from its participation, but they've broken to side with the coup in Niger. So we have a situation where ECOWAS is itself taking a strong stance on the one hand, and on the other hand, it's no longer speaking as a united voice for West Africa. We really seem to have these two blocks in West Africa now. ECOWAS did intervene in Gambia several years ago, which is a very tiny country. It just seems like very hard for me to imagine like Nigerian troops pouring over the border to reinstall Bazoum in Niger. That seems to be a bluff and, and an empty threat. My first instinct was to think that's a bluff. They're drawing a red line and they may regret it because it's a sort of, you know, if they call their bluff, what are you going to do? Apparently, there are reports that ECOWAS is seriously talking about it and they're talking about what they called, I think in quotation marks, a surgical strike, meaning specifically to target those elements of the presidential guard that are holding President Bazoum and to try to liberate him and avoid a larger battle. But it, it is, I think you're exactly right, it's very hard to envisage this kind of a military intervention on the scale that it would require. The Gambian example is, it's true, they did intervene. It's also true that Gambia is a very small country. It was in a very difficult circumstance in that Senegal, which encircles Gambia completely, right, except for the little bit of ocean front of Gambia. So Senegal is both to the north and the south of Gambia. I had a very strong interest in seeing that succeed and play that role. So it was a very special case. So I've done a few episodes about Niger over the last few years, including one that was recorded on the day of Bazoum's inauguration, in which he was the first president to be elected following a succession from another democratically elected president since something like 1960. The person I was interviewed didn't like necessarily convey a degree of hope or optimism, but there's a sense of, of like at least democratic continuity. And I take it in the years since, Niger has experienced something of of a boom in economic turnaround, as well as significant gains against jihadist insurgents that had been really devastating parts of the periphery in Niger, and that the strategies put in place by Bazoum were rather effective. Is that your take? That is my take. And it was indeed historic in that sense that it was the first time one elected president replaced another elected president in Niger's history. The former president, Isufu, Mohamed Isufu, won the Mo Ibrahim Prize shortly thereafter, which is a coveted prize for democracy promotion in Africa. The prize, we should say, goes to African leaders who follow the constitution and don't seek extra constitutional terms in power and are generally regarded as good Democrat, small d. Exactly. And we should note that in some years, in fact, in many years, the prize isn't even given because there's no one to give it to. So, And it comes with a large purse. And it comes with a large purse. My point is that this was a widely recognized from the outside as a good transition. It's true also that it was flawed, and especially the second round of the election was flawed. And it is possible that the amount of cheating at the margins that's possible in any election, and especially perhaps in elections under the context of a place like Niger, might have made the difference or it might not have. So I think it is important to point out that there was, after the election, quite a bit of protest and dissatisfaction. And Niger appeared to be pretty divided between the partisans of President Bazoum, who were glad he had won, and those who claimed that his victory had been completely fraudulent. But your other point, I think, is exactly right. That is that In the intervening time, in the last two years, 
rather than increase dissatisfaction, if we've seen anything, we saw a move in a direction of President Bazoum seeming to get a lot of credit, both internationally and I think domestically, or at least it's my sense domestically, in terms of the direction in which he was moving. I think there was very good arguments to be made that his sort of combination of pragmatism in dealing with, uh, obviously, the major threat, the sort of uh, terrorist threat, the jihadi insurgencies in the region, of attempting to negotiate when possible. He liberated some people. He was willing to, to enter into discussions with various leaders of these movements at the same time as being firm and, and even handed and attempting to try to address some of the social underlying issues that were driving the tensions at the local level, which are usually the kinds of things that push local people to join these organizations, right? They're local grievances, local injustices. And President Bazoum seemed to have been making, a, I think, a very good faith effort and a, and a fairly successful one in that respect. And so I think you can't deny that there was underlying tensions in Niger, but the tensions were not growing. And if anything, they were diminishing. Therefore, this was not the precipitation for the coup. Things seem to be moving in a better direction, as you noted. And it's because of this that ties with the United States and, and presumably France as well grew stronger during the last couple of years of Bazoum in power. Can you just briefly describe American interests in Niger. I know there is a drone base in, what is it, Agadez? And what is like the purpose of that military deployment? And how has it been impacted thus far, to your knowledge, by the coup? Yeah, so Niger has emerged largely because of circumstances in neighboring countries, as the Sahel in West Africa has been a source of increasing concern because of terrorist activities, violent extremism, etc., in the area, as that's increased the sort of room for maneuver for the outside world, and so for the Americans in particular, and for the French and others, has decreased, especially with as they lost access to Mali and Burkina Faso in the last few years, as those countries turned towards Russia and the Wagner Group, and certainly a very, very strong anti-French and anti-Western tendency. So there was sort of a movement towards Niger as a stable country, a reasonably pragmatic, sort of one where people could work, and one where you could reasonably claim to be working with a democratically elected government. And that's important. You know, Chad next door to the east of Niger is also an ally still of the West in the region and has also played an important role in some of the anti-terrorist efforts in the region. But Chad's a complicated case. It's, you know, the president of 30 years was killed in battle and his son unconstitutionally has succeeded him, at least as an interim president. And that son, last October, violently oversaw repression of protest against his regime in the streets. So Chad's a, it's, it's a difficult case. Like from a, like a Western perspective, you got to kind of hold your nose when dealing with Chad, but Niger, you could be a little more above board because it is credibly a democracy moving in the right direction. Exactly, exactly. And that's exactly the expression I used somewhere along the line. I think I stole that from an interview I read of yours, now that you mentioned okay. it. Yeah. So Niger has emerged as was a pragmatic case, a practical one, one that was reasonably friendly to the West, willing to accept aid. And the competing sometimes security interest and principles of pro-democracy support that the US might have sometimes are at odds. And in Niger is a case where they did not seem to be at odds. And that was attractive. And so, yes, in the last few years, we've invested fairly heavily in that support. And there's American training and support activities. No American direct engagement in military activity in Niger since the killing of four American soldiers some years ago. But there's a, there's a lot of training and support. And then there's that drone base in Agadez, which I understand provides intelligence, surveillance for the region, not just Niger and the north. But recall, we have Boko Haram operating in the Lake Chad Basin, there's Libya to the north, in fact, all the way further east over Sudan. Uh, information apparently is gathered on the situation in Sudan. And of course, over Mali and Burkina Faso and the sort of central Sahel and the conflict zone. So it's an important military intelligence base. And for France, the, the former colonial power, it is also like a key ally. Yeah, France very much an ally. France is a former colonial power in much of the Sahel and had, has had a sort of back and forth history of 
intervention and maintaining ties in the area. In 2013, when France intervened militarily to save the Malian regime from what appeared to be imminent fall to rebel and jihadi forces moving towards Bamako, France was welcomed as a savior in the area. And hard to imagine it now, 10 years later, but there was waving of French flags and jubilant crowds in the streets. That's completely reversed. And now what we've seen is very, very strong anti-French sentiments, a sense that France is maintaining these relationships for its own interest, that France may indeed be behind many of the problems, etc. And as France lost influence in those other countries, Niger maintained pragmatic and cordial relations with France. That's now proving to be an issue. But France also, as a result, moved its operation in Barkhan, which was based in Mali, to Niger, and sort of made Niger the center of its Sahelian operations. So the future of French and American military involvement in Niger is is uncertain. And it does appear, however, that the coup leaders are making overtures, could you say, to Russia or to the Wagner Group? I take it that a member of like the coup team recently visited Burkina Faso, where he met with coup leaders there and Wagner representatives there as well. Is that your sense of what's happening? Well, it's hard to tell. But here's my sense. Yes, I also, I, I understand uh, the number two of this junta now in charge in Niger visited Mali and Burkina Faso. It's not surprising because this they need support and Mali and Burkina issued a statement a few days ago saying that they would consider an invasion or an attack on Niger as an attack, a declaration of war against them, that they stood ready to participate in solidarity, etc. So this regime is obviously has a strong interest in reaching out to potential allies and friends in the region. But about what this means in terms of a turn towards Russia, there is no indication that either any members of this current junta, General Chani or any others, had any particular disposition or any particular sort of ideological orientation towards Russia and or, or for that matter, anti-French sentiment. It does not seem to have been sort of a precipitating cause for the coup. What I think is, however, happening is that they need to support having led a coup that didn't have any immediate precipitating cause. There weren't crowds on the street. There wasn't a political blockage. All of a sudden, for somewhat personal reasons, they had a falling out with the president and have taken over. They need to find a way to legitimate, to frame the justification for this coup and to mobilize people in support, particularly if they're facing an imminent invasion or a military intervention from the outside. And inevitably, anti-France resonates. You can mobilize people on the streets. And the anti-France slips into pro-Russian very easily in the context of the Sahel right now. And so I think that's the dilemma that France and the United States are facing, is that you don't want to encourage that. Anything you do to try to intervene is only likely to backfire against you in terms of popular sentiment, popular support. And so doing nothing sort of allows it to consolidate. Doing something may make it even worse. And I think that's a dilemma. So There's no indication that this sort of anti-French sentiment and or pro-Russian sentiment were in any way as a cause of this coup or even there at the beginning, but it's almost certain that going to be part of the rhetoric of this junta to try to maintain itself. Well, so to that end, I mean, do you foresee in the coming months there to be like a consolidating regional alignment or axis with Burkina Faso, Niger and Mali around Russia, like they are like Russia's outposts in the Sahel, and and it's like an expanding outpost. It kind of started with Mali, then moved to Burkina Faso, and now potentially Niger. Yeah, I don't know. It's very hard to sort of predict how this will unfold, but a number of sort of considerations there. It's not impossible. If this coup succeeds, and if it finds itself, it looks to have succeeded, if it consolidates itself and is not somehow removed, And if it does, in fact, do this sort of turn to anti-French sovereignty is the word that's being thrown a lot, the sovereignty of our country, etc., as a justification for this, you would imagine it will make alliances, stronger alliances with Mali and Burkina. There are obvious reasons for doing so. They're all engaged in the same struggle in the central area there, and therefore a turn towards Russia and the Wagner Group. But I think the Russian foreign ministry made a statement calling for Bazoum to be reinstated, Right. The Wagner Group made a statement, allegedly made a statement, saying that this was an expression of the Nigerian people's struggle against neocolonialism. So we had competing discourses from the Russian 
Ministry of Foreign Affairs and from the Wagner Group. It's clear that Russia benefits from the activities of the Wagner Group, but I think, as we all know, that the relations between the Russian state and the Wagner Group seem to be delicate, and I have no information on what's happening behind the scenes. My, my point is that it's not at all clear what this would mean, whether it's a Wagner Group capable and willing to attempt to actually provide military support to all three regimes, and with what consequences. And I guess the other question is for, for how long? There's no indication that the Wagner Group support in Mali or in any other countries in the region have made anything any better. And just as the tide of public opinion turned against France and against others, you can imagine it turning against the Russians if we see more atrocities against civilians and more human rights violations and that they're perceived as benefiting financially in terms of resources from this at the expense of local people. So uh, it's, it's really hard to sort of see how this is going to unfold long term. Can I ask your analysis of the role that Niger's vast deposits of uranium play in this unfolding situation? I mean, presumably one of the reasons that France has a military deployment in Niger is not divorced from the fact that France requires a lot of Nigerian uranium to fuel its nuclear power. We've also seen in other cases, particularly in the Central African Republic, of Wagner Group mercenaries getting control of mines and other natural resources in cahoots with the governments there to enrich themselves and, and presumably also enrich the Russian regime. Do you foresee uranium mines in Niger being like a central locus in which people might vie for control, various players might vie for control? Well, uranium is certainly important in Niger, for Niger as an export product, and it's been important to France because France has been the primary recipient of Nigerian uranium. My understanding is, however, I don't think it's a central issue here. I believe, if I'm not mistaken, Niger is the world's seventh producer, but it represents about 4% of global uranium production or something of the sort, much of which goes to France. But there's no immediate threat to the French energy sector if uranium from Niger gets cut off immediately. Apparently, there's a, those are stockpiles and it takes time. This is at least the analysts that I was been reading recently about that say there's no immediate threat. In the longer term, it would require a readjustment and a recalibration on France's part, that part of their energy sector. But I think the rhetorical or the sort of symbolic importance of that is perhaps bigger than its actual economic one. There's been a lot for years of discussion of, oh, you know, France's interest in Niger is because it really needs the uranium and really wants the uranium. And therefore, it's very easy to turn that around and say, France is only here to exploit our uranium and to profit from us, etc., and to turn that into anti-French sentiment. That's certainly there. It's certainly true. Uranium's important. It's an important resource. But I don't think uranium's what's driving this, and I don't think uranium will determine the outcome. So lastly, our conversation has focused a lot on like the international implications of this coup in Niger and what it means for ECOWAS, what it means for the United States, for French foreign policy. And it seems like a lot of media coverage follows those threads and not a lot of media coverage focuses on what it means for the people of Niger. What do you suspect to be the biggest outcomes from this coup to the lives of ordinary people in the country? I think the domestic implications of this are absolutely central to how we think about the coup. And the standard way to say it is be this is a significant setback towards these years' progress towards democracy. And I think that's true. And I think it's really true because Despite the fact Niger, since the early 1990s, when most of West Africa undertook transitions to democracy and has attempted, Niger was always presented as a very unstable case. They had a series of coups. We went, in fact, in Niger from what they called the Third Republic in 1993 to the one that was just overthrown was the Seventh Republic. So it was seen as instability. And in fact, if you go back and look at that, you see that each of those crisis points was punctuated by an institutional blockage that then led to a discussion and a debate about attempts to fix institutions to make them work better. And there is a really good argument to be made that Niger was progressing along those lines. 
It's not to say that democracy was perfect. It was certainly wasn't President Bazoum's election may in fact have been fraudulently won, at least at the margins. But the institutions were gradually being put in place. And those institutions are the institutions that make it possible to envisage a democratic system in the good sense. And so, you know, I've heard and we've seen recently, well, you know, we have this focus on on the form of democracy, but not the substance. I think it's a little bit of a false distinction. It's true, you can have a form without substance, but I'm not sure you can have substance without form. I think you need to have institutions and try to make those institutions work well so that then you can start having states that respond to the needs and desires of populations. By any standard, this coup is an interruption of a progress, of a process that Niger has been engaged in for 30 years and that has made progress. If we look back, the last coup in Niger was in 2010, and it happened after a transition where a government was freely elected and the president served two five-year terms, and then he tried to change the constitution unconstitutionally to stay in power. And so he was overthrown, and a whole new transition took place, and it created this government that then Isufu came to power, President Isufu, for 10 years, and it was relatively unthinkable that he would try to stay in power precisely for this previous history, hence the transition that we talked about earlier, right? The transition, the election that led to President Bazoum's election. So my point is that these periodic crises in the past have actually been part of an iterative process of, I think, building state institutions and democratic institutions and with all the caveats about their imperfection and their limitations and what it means. And this has been interrupted. And I think that's a setback. And I think it's likely to be a setback for the lives of the Nigerian people. I don't mean to be overly rosy about democracy. It's also possible that in large parts of the country, people will hardly notice the coup and hardly notice what happens after the coup because the vast majority of Nigerians are spending their time attempting simply to make a living to feed their children and feed themselves under extraordinarily difficult circumstances. And the state presence is minimal and in many parts, and that everything that the state does, whether it's security or health or education, is very limited. And there's good reason to be critical of that. And so we need to recognize that there's progress towards democracy only first helps and, and is, is felt by a proportion of the population, or perhaps a limited portion, perhaps the urban, perhaps more the intellectual elite and whatever. But I think there's a reasonable argument to be made that in the longer run, it is that which allows you to sort of gradually build a state that is functional and that responds to the needs of people and that does attempt to provide things like education, health care, and security, and that expands its effort to do so. Thank you so much for your time and analysis. This was very helpful and obviously very timely as well. My pleasure, Mark. Thank you for listening to Global Dispatches. Our show is produced by me, Mark Leon Goldberg, and edited and mixed by Levi Sharp. If you have questions or comments, please email us using the contact button on globaldispatchespodcast.com. Before you go, do take a moment to show your support for the show by becoming a premium subscriber. If you're listening on Apple Podcasts, you can do so with a couple taps of your thumb. If you're listening elsewhere, you can go to patreon.com slash globaldispatches. We rely on support from listeners to continue to do what we do far into the future. And by becoming a premium subscriber, you will unlock access to our entire archive of hundreds and hundreds of episodes. Please rate or review the show on Apple Podcasts.